John Orchestra. Thank you, all of you uh, photographers, for sending uh, in your what you captured of what God has created. These are all inspiring images. In fact, that has sort of set my mind to thinking uh, for just a few minutes as we prepare our hearts. I have, um, have, of course, been doing a lot of research on these subjects these past several weeks, and I've come across some interesting data that says this sense of awe that you feel when you see something magnificent or you look up into the sky packed with stars or you stand there on the side uh, along with other tourists watching, listening to the crashing of the Niagara Falls. Sites like that inspire a sense of awe. Webster defines awe as a combination of veneration and wonder. Now, what's really interesting is with all of the research they're doing on the way we're hardwired, our own brains, they're discovering that anybody and everybody experiences all, whether they're believers or unbelievers. In fact, it's sort of sent, uh, you know, the evolutionists scurrying as to why it is that the human being experiences all. Well, we would take it right into the way that God has has created us this, this sacred sense of veneration in the face of awe-inspiring sights and sounds. Unlike the animal, the human is wired for this unique sense of awe. In fact, neuroscientists can now even detect its effects on the brain. I published just a few months ago, in fact, it came across this article out of a secular resource at the latest annual conference of the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. That's got to be an exciting conference to attend. But the research is revealing that when a person experiences a sense of awe, their brains shut down areas that relate to a sense of self. So when you're having this moment of awe, you kind of forget yourself. And now they can even map it. In other words, when you're standing there at some beautiful scene, some beautiful sight, you're at the base of that waterfall, you what? You forget about yourself. And you're kind of lost in the wonder of this spectacle. And all this research is, is simply catching up to the ancient truths of Scripture revealed by God's Spirit. As I mentioned earlier, the psalmist David writes it this way, They who dwell in the ends of the earth stand in awe. That is, everybody on the earth experiences awe. They stand in awe of your wonders where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. You invite the human race to joyous worship. I love one paraphrase who renders it, all of your wonders are on display in nature's trophy room. Dawn and dusk take turns calling to us, inviting us to come and worship. By the way, what happens when you worship God? You lose a sense, a focus on self. And you're lost in the glory and the majesty and the greatness of God. I have been wanting to mention this particular verse as well. If you have your Bibles, you can go to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, and you might just write a musical note if you know how to draw that in the margin where I'll show you in a moment. But David writes in Psalm 19 and chapter 1 this wonderful text. In fact, this paragraph really goes beyond his understanding. It's one of those wonderful evidences of inspiration. He, he wrote more than he knew. 
God's spirit is moving him along. He says this, the heavens are declaring, they're telling of the glory of God. That is, remember the heavens means in that plural noun form, the universe. The universe is declaring the glory of God and their expanse, that is how large it is, and he can only see so much, is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. That is, you don't hear a language, but guess what? Notice verse 4. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. They might not be speaking in English, but they're making some sounds. Again, we know much more than he would have imagined when he wrote this. He's referring to the stars and planets in the universe. And he writes here, their line has gone out throughout all the earth. That word translated line can be translated cord. C-H-O-R-D for you musicians. Or musical note. The Greek translation of this Hebrew text, we call it the Septuagint. Jesus quoted from it. It was around before the apostles. They all noted it. But the Greek translation of this Hebrew text uses the Greek word that literally could be translated musical note. Their musical notes are heard throughout the universe. That's a fascinating thought because David is saying here something that he couldn't hear. God's creation, some of it he could hear, is singing songs. I mean, I'm right in the middle of reviewing this at about six o'clock this morning and a bluebird lands on the windowsill and just starts singing and I'm thinking, that's awesome. Thank you, Lord, for that. And what David didn't know back then was that one day there would be an entire field of science known as bioacoustics, which would really do nothing more than verify this ancient text and the truth of it. Bioacoustics, if you want to research it, along with the data collected by orbiting satellites, now reveal to us that we are literally surrounded by Billions of musical notes. So our sense of awe at the wonders of his hand simply grow larger as our understanding of our world and universe grows. An article put it this way, a single hydrogen atom we know now emits 100 frequencies It's more musical than a piano, which only has 88. Undulations of light waves are making music. The electron shell of the carbon atom produces the same musical scale as a Gregorian chant. The smallest plants around us are actually emitting tones. Even earthworms are beating out percussion sounds. Metal arcs have a musical range of 37 octaves. Even ordinary flies hovering over meadows they now know are buzzing in harmony with each other. Massive planets are emitting musical notes and staccato sounds. We are surrounded by the music of creation. David said it is declaring the work of his hands. Their line, their chords, their music, their harmony goes around the earth and beyond. Imagine, imagine, there's no verse on this one, but can I use my imagination? Imagine that one day the Lord might allow us to hear the music of orbiting stars and spinning planets, which are actually making harmony with other heavenly bodies. And I would imagine as they're changing their location and their orbit, the key is changing, and the music is 
changing and from a billion stars it is creating this magnificent crescendo of incredible music and what is the music all about david tells us here the heavens are broadcasting the universe is telling it is making music to the glory of god See, this is where you lose your sense of self. And you get lost in the amazing glory of God. And what is the result then for us as believers? Well, one of the distinguishing marks of the believer that sets us apart from the unbelieving world is that all this leads us to thank the Lord for what he spoke into existence. So you look at these photographs and you're out traveling around and you see something spectacular and you just, you just naturally, you just automatically say, wow, Lord, thank you for that. That's a distinguishing mark of the believer. Think of it this way. If an atheist and a believer are watching the same incredibly beautiful sunset, we now know we're all hardwired to experience this sense of awe. Wow. The only difference is the atheist has no one to thank. And we do. It's actually worse than that. According to Romans chapter 1, it says that the unbeliever intuitively knows better there must be a creator but he suppresses Paul writes the truth about God's power that is he literally pushes it down and away Paul writes in that text and so they refuse to honor God or give him thanks in fact just yesterday a news article popped up on my iPhone. You know, I've got to disconnect that thing. It's taken way too much time. But this is from a secular news source which has reported on what it's calling one of the most provocative studies of the year. In fact, I immediately downloaded it. I'm connected by Wi-Fi, and I hit a button, and it printed it out, and I've already shared it. Listen to this. Again, it just substantiates Scripture. What they're calling one of the most provocative studies of the year, a scientific team made up of individuals from the United States and Switzerland have made an astonishing discovery that all humans alive today, and I'm quoting, all humans alive today are the offspring of a common mother and father. Startling. We know their names. <laughs> Adam and Eve. But isn't it, isn't it wonderful, though? Just keep exploring. Keep learning. I'll just keep the book of Genesis open. Based on, it goes on to say, the study of mitochondrial DNA, which I understand is passed along by the mother, samplings from millions of DNA samplings, they have also concluded that 90%, they're going to get to 100% as they keep studying, but 90% of all animal species alive today, this is fascinating, come from parents that all began giving birth at roughly the same time. Isn't that really fascinating, though, to think that they've kind of substantiated it by the research. Now, they're putting 250,000 years on it. We'll let them, you know, do that if they want. That's, that's okay. But what happened to 65 million years? Sounds like we're getting closer to Genesis 1. The scientific team... One more comment here. From the Rockefeller University and the University of Basel, that was the, uh, the universities, reached this conclusion after analyzing the DNA of 5 million animals from 100,000 different species. 
it, it is, it's just one of those undeniable discoveries. One of the scientists that said on record, and this got my attention, and I quote, this conclusion, original human couple, all the animals are giving birth about the same time. He said, this conclusion is very surprising, and I fought against it as hard as I could. I fought against it as hard as I could. Why? Because of the implications of a much younger population of humans and animals, because of the evidence that we all came from the same original couple, evidence that now is going to have to be reinterpreted, and may I suggest suppressed, I don't think they're going to change any textbooks out there anytime soon. The implications are staggering, but not for us. In fact, we already know someone whom we can thank. Our creator, Lord, who not only created us, became, but became one of us in order to redeem us. Our creator, God, who instilled in us a moral code and then came to earth to die, paying the penalty of our guilt because we are all lawbreakers. Our creator, God, because he not only spoke the worlds into existence, he, through his Son, has spoken to us the word of truth and grace and mercy and forgiveness, and he has created in our hearts a new song. Because our creator God not only created life, but he gave his life so that we could have life eternal. And maybe, just maybe, be allowed to hear the symphony of the stars. So on this Thanksgiving weekend, we've come today because we have somebody to thank, and it's our tradition to take communion together as a church family. The deacons are going to take their places and prepare to serve us. We're going to focus on him and thank him. If you're a believer here, you've accepted the Lord Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You're invited to partake. You might be visiting here from another city or state, another country. You're welcome to join us as your brothers and sisters in partaking. If you don't know Christ personally, let these plates pass by you. They will only serve to condemn you further one day. However, let me do what David did and invite you into the joy of worship. If you know enough of the gospel right where you sit, before these plates reach you, you can acknowledge him in your heart as your Lord and your Savior and then partake.